Right, we're here in the National Trust car park above the bay at Ringstead with Portland over in the distance with the uh, the harbour in here I think we've got various ships uh, at anchor in the lee of Portland and the harbour itself looking out to sea but in the foreground between us and the uh, the breaker line you can see that most of the landscape is made up of grass Grass is amazing stuff. It's very, very good at capturing carbon. And it's very, very good at being adapted to being constantly grazed by things like these. They're rather jolly sheep. Basically, that's because instead of like um, most broadleaf plants, it doesn't grow from the, the tip, the furthest from the, the ground. It grows from its base. So as the leaves of the grass are eaten off, it still grows from the base. Whereas if you're an ordinary uh, broad-leaved uh, plant or forb, your growing tip gets eaten off, you've got to remake a new one. But grass doesn't matter so much. Of course grass exists to produce um, seed heads so it could reproduce itself. But in the meantime, if it's present prevented from producing a seed head, it can reproduce vegetatively. It can spread and cover large areas, stabilise the ground. And in the right conditions, as well as being good at capturing carbon, it can also store carbon. If you take an ordinary uh, grass leaf, it doesn't store carbon for very long. But in the right conditions, if the ground conditions are slightly wet and the things left undisturbed and not ploughed, it can build up layers of carbon in the soil. If the soil tends to be waterlogged, it can store the carbon for longer than the lifespan of an individual grass plant. It is also very efficient at photosynthesis. And that is why, together with its valuable property of being able to keep growing while it's constantly eaten off by these chaps, it is such a foundation of all our agriculture, all our grazing agriculture, and also corn is a grass, wheat is a grass, rye and oats, all grasses, and all have this uh, the same characteristic of being very, very good at capturing carbon. Right, we've stopped here to look at some improved grassland, but over against the uh, Hedge line over there, you can see a nice big seeker buck, and there's a doe over there. I've just seen a couple of pheasants flying across, cock and a hen. GoPro probably won't pick those up, which is a bit sad. But anyway, here we've got improved grassland. Oh, we've got deer slots here, and all the way through there, and you can see the lines, hopefully where it's been drilled with a grass crop. So it would have been ploughed just before that in all likelihood and possibly had a pot of maize crop. And you can see again down here, see the stripes heading down that way. So this is all improved grassland. This is done for production of grass, which is hugely important in the British countryside because, as I've said before, grass is extremely good, extremely efficient at capturing carbon. So this is wet heath. Lots of different species here. There's a polytrichum moss over there. And there's various rushes. This is conglomerate rush, more polytrichum. And various different species of sphagnum. I think this one's sphagnum papillosum, which is the common one. We'll put him back in a minute. And seal the water in that. Sphagnum mosses change the environment to suit themselves. They need wet conditions to get started. But over many, many years, they tend to make the conditions wetter and more acid. Over many decades, in the right conditions, they can build up layer upon layer 
telling you those wet, waterlogged and acidic conditions so that other species can't get a, a toehold. So even things like the uh, Scots pine and the rhododendron find it difficult to start and difficult to grow. If that process keeps going, then they can start actually sequestering carbon. The bottom layers of your peat bog will retain cold, dark, acidic and waterlogged so that the organic matter deep within them can't rot down. And eventually that carbon can be locked away from biosphere processes. Unless of course somebody comes up and turns it into uh, to peat for use in gardens. So that is carbon sequestration. You could argue, and some people would argue, that these trees are sequestered carbon. But you can see that they're dead. Trees do not sequester carbon. They capture carbon, and these are doing it quite quickly, quite efficiently, and they store it during their lifetime. These are Scots pines, these are dead. So they're in the third phase of their life, growth, maturity and decay, these are decaying. Carbon in, in here is being released, going back to the biosphere. And just in passing we could mention that with all these pine trees here and all these birch trees, this habitat is quite quickly going from wet heath and bleak valley mire over towards woodland and forest. And in 20, 25 years time, this will be totally covered in pine unless uh, management work is done. And these species, such as the sphagnum mosses, and these things like this uh, rather nice pondweed, bottom mageton, in these pools and the things that will be living in there, such as dragonfly nymphs and the species that they feed on, will disappear. The reason we're here is because over that way, you can see the uh, Coast Guard lookout on the top. Hopefully, the GoPro will pick it out. And you can also hopefully see a hint of white cliffs. Over out beyond there is the uh, area that was featured in a post I did uh, beginning of last year, in which we did a drift dive off of Durdle Door, which is over that way. And we had a look at this stuff, which is Merle. Hopefully you can see that. Let's pick it up again. Merle is a red alga. So it's uh, only very, very distantly related to these green plants that we see all around us on land. It's more closely related to bacteria. And it's got slightly weird habit habits including laying down an endoskeleton of calcium carbonate. It's not terribly wonderful at capturing carbon in that it does it very, very slowly. But it's very, very good at not just storing carbon, but sequestering carbon. So this is calcium carbonate. This is laid down by the, the merle plant itself. And when they're alive, they're bright pink and they come in these branching shapes and they grow very slowly. But this calcium carbonate is pretty resistant to being used by anything in the biosphere. And it can sit and it can uh, persist for hundreds if not thousands of years. And off there, all the way along, down at about 20 meters depth, there are huge volumes of this stuff. It forms great big dunes. Most of it's dead. A very small amount is alive. But uh, basically that's a huge store of sequestered carbon. And this is unusual in nature that plants directly sequester carbon. Usually the plants have to rot down and then while they're still not quite fully rotted, they have to be incorporated into geological cycles. So eventually they're buried down in the ground and the carbon in their bodies becomes locked away, a 
that's what sequestered is from the biosphere so the biosphere can't get at it that's what fossil fuels are oil coal gas lesser extent lignite which is semi-fossilized peat are all fossil fuels and it's burning fossil fuels and releasing the carbon that they contain into the atmosphere which has basically triggered our current crisis with the greenhouse effect right these are trees wait for this car to go and then we'll start again This is standing inside the wood. I've never been here in my life before. I've been past it. But this is, again, as is very common around here, overstood hazel coppice. And in this particular instance, we've got a lot of ash and fuel maple along this edge, which seems to be an old boundary. But anyway, I digress. The reason I stopped to film this is basically to say that trees are quite good at capturing carbon and better than grass at storing it but trees do not sequester carbon. All the carbon that is stored in here for the lifetime of the tree is only stored temporarily. And even a hawthorn tree might live a lot longer than a person. And an oak tree definitely will live a lot longer than a person. What they say is, an oak tree, this is actually an ash, it takes 200 years to grow, 200 years of maturity, 200 years to die, it might have another 200 years as it rots down. And some of these ashes will be a lot older than 200 years because they've been cut and then have grown up. So the root systems will be older than the trees themselves. But that storage of that carbon in the root systems and in the tops of the trees is temporary. It all goes back to the ground eventually because woodlands are extremely good at cycling carbon. And some of you may think that's heresy, saying that trees do not sequester carbon, but it is true. For carbon to be sequestered, it must be locked away from the biosphere. And all the carbon in here is still part of the biosphere. It is still in cycle. If you cut this down and burn it, you're just accelerating the rate at which it naturally goes back into the atmosphere. Sequestered carbon is like fossil carbon. If you burn that, you're increasing the net amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. For carbon to be stored in here, to get into the ground and into the, uh, the rocks, it has to be fossilised. Some of this would eventually make it were it not for the intervention of man, but only a very, very tiny proportion of all the carbon you see here. Trees do not sequester carbon.